Many good professors as an undergrad at McGill, um, um, and, and one person in whose lab I worked for a couple of years and really got my first taste of real research, and uh, you know, that, was, that was really important. And uh, I think Ray Wu, my mentor in graduate school, was a really major influence. And I think he, he ran his lab in a really good way in, in terms of not micromanaging people, but just sort of being there to be helpful and letting people come up with ideas and run with them. And so I've, I've you know, tried to follow that kind of approach myself. Yeah, I mean, the scientists, our major mentors are our, our graduate advisors and our postdoctoral advisors. I mean, these are the people that shape the way that you think and in, in every possible way. And you know, before that, I think my AP chemistry high school teacher, she was really the one to turn me on to science and you know, you know groom you, make you think that you really know what you're doing and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to uh, thank you. I want to really try to embarrass both of you, which I've tried before. Uh, you, as I mentioned, I pointed out before, you're both at different places in your career. If you were advising somebody who was coming on board as a graduate student or postdoc, which is part of this mentoring system that creates scientists, would it be better to be in the lab of somebody who's already won big awards or somebody who's hungry and starting out? <laughs> <laughs> what would you say, just generally, I know that you two are, are, are are equally competent mentors? I would have to say that I think that really doesn't matter. It's more a matter of the personalities involved, and you don't want to be in a lab of someone who's telling you what to do every step along the way. You've got to learn how to think and be independent. And I think that can be in a small lab or a big lab or a young lab or a more established lab. Well, you told a great story this afternoon about an experiment that became typical, to, uh, excuse me, critical to of what you've accomplished, which has to, had to do with the growth of membranes. And you said it was done by a postdoc, who, and you told him it wasn't going to work, right? No, it was a graduate student. Oh, graduate, new graduate student. And you know, this happens. This happens a lot, right? People, people come to me and said, "Oh, I've had this idea. You know, I want to give it a try." And you know, it sounds kind of silly to me. And I said, that'll never work. And, you know, if they're good, they'll just go and do it and come back and say, look, see, it works. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love that. Uh, um, I, I think, actually, uh, the sooner that you identify what it is that you want to do, the problem that you want to pursue, it, the, the key is to finding what your passion is in research and science. And as long as the person who is your mentor does not make you hate your life, <laughs> um, and actually, if you're really passionate about what you're doing, it almost doesn't matter what that person is because it, you go in there, you get whatever mentorship you can, you love your day in and your day out, and I, that is the way that good science is, is born, hands down. Our next question will come from Samantha Klasfeld. So I'm just going to say my question. OK. Um, certain genes cause disease, physical traits, or other biotic functions. What do you believe was the purpose of the first sequence? That's okay. a good question. So I would just, so the, the, I think the right way to think of it is not, not as in the sense of a purpose, right? But the, but the first sequence, if it conveys an advantage, it'll be selected for, and it'll take over the population. So, um, so, so if, then if you can rephrase it, what, was the, what were the first selectively advantageous traits? And so uh, when I gave my talk, I talked about how uh, uh, the ability to synthesize a particular kind of lipid, a phospholipid that can make membranes. I, I, I think that's a good possibility for what the role of the first um, advantageous sequence was. Uh, I think there's kind of a longer history of thinking that the first advantageous sequences were just involved in replication. But I think if it's really true that there's a chemical way of doing replication, it kind of opens up more possibilities for uh, ro different roles for uh, sequences to be selected. What was the first gene? 
I was going to naively say that it was involved in replication. <laughs> <laughs> so there may be some controversy about this <laughs> for a while. Uh, we want to now hear from Mike Can. I hope I pronounced Can. Please come up. Um, scientists inevitably face uh, failure a lot more often in their careers than they face success. I mean, a large part of scientific study and experimentation is refining existing techniques and finding new methodologies. So what, what advice would you give a young aspiring scientist about getting through those moments when you realize that your research or ideas aren't taking you anywhere and you must find a new direction? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, if it's really clear that you're doing something that's not working, it's time to, you know, dump it and just do something different. And, you know, this has happened to me multiple times. Um, uh, in fact, when I started graduate school, I actually went into a plant physiology lab and department at Cornell. That's why I went to Cornell, was to go into a plant lab, because I wanted to, I had this grandiose scheme of how I was going to use this the simple green alga as a model system for developmental genetics. It was a complete disaster. You know, I had no technical ability to do it, and there was no one there to talk about with it. And, and you know, so probably wasted about a year on that. And then, and then uh, you know, I just said, okay, this is not going anywhere. It's time to do something different. Came up with a different idea, moved to a different lab, started a different project. And uh, it's hard, it's hard to, you know, when you've made a big investment in something, it's hard to drop it, but that's what you've got to do. Anybody else in the audience? Sir. Hi, um, I'm actually a student at the Honors College on this campus, and I'm honored to be actually an intern currently uh, at Scripps, Florida. Uh, I actually have two questions, but I think they're pretty equal in importance. Um, the first one is, um, what important characteristics do you think makes a great scientist? And personally, um, what characteristics do you, each of you think that you have that has helped get to where you are today? Um, that was the first one. Uh, so, well, I think, you know, being, you, you have to be, you know, passionately curious about how things work. Right? And I think to be successful at figuring things out, you've, you've got to find the right questions, which means questions that, are, that actually can be solved. Right? As I said earlier, lots of interesting questions that there's no hope of figuring out right now. So, so you've got to work on things that are, are both interesting and, and doable, practical. And, and I think also what is, is really nice, if you can do it, is to find questions that are interesting, practical, and no one else has thought of. <laughs> that really helps a lot. <laughs> uh, Jack talk, touched on passion and curiosity. Those are the two, I think, quintessential elements to being successful. And, and, and layered on top of that is kind of this dogged, you know, uh, lack of fear of failure and the ability to just keep throwing yourself at it because there are many more days when you go home and nothing has worked and you have no idea what's going on and it just takes a night to go home and just set it aside and come back again tomorrow. It's that ability to come back tomorrow. It's hard sometimes. That's <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it's really important to be persistent. Um, but I think you know, it's also important just not to follow the crowd, right? not to just do what everyone else is doing. And find your own interesting question. Uh, that kind of points to my second question, which is, I know Dr. Pagel was mentioning that you were, uh, you played the piccolo. Uh, I'm actually kind of a weirdo, I guess. Uh, I am working on a double major in biochemistry and the visual arts. Um, so I was just wondering um, if you had an opinion on the importance of actually having that art background and that you can kind of, if you, if you have that background and how, if you've seen any scientists and how they can bring that into the laboratory, that creative side. Science is art. There's really no difference between the two. It's just a matter of expression. I honestly believe that. I mean, it's uh, having no time for music anymore has made me no less an artist, I think. I just work in molecules and devices now. Uh, 